This is a production of Cornell University. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really remarkable what you guys have done. I almost feel like everybody's here. In fact, when I walked out of my office, I expected to see other people there um, who I've been you know, following on Zoom and everything, so, and through the Slack channel. So thank you guys for doing this and for um, and persisting within um, what is really a novel environment that we're all working to adapt to, um, to and as we sit and talk about plant adaptation and evolution and, and breeding techniques to be able to do that. So we're just being as diverse and as um, adaptable as the plants that we study. So maybe we're learning something from them. And I just have to get a give a shout out to Paul's um, uh, image that he has <laughs> when he disappeared. That's really cool. I didn't notice that before. So very nice. Um, I'll have to get more creative with that. So I wanted to sort of uh, boy, when, when it transitioned into being a, a virtual symposium, I decided I was going to try to um, sort of blow things up a little bit. So this is my first time sort of presenting in this way. Um, I want to talk to you about really holistically about what my lab is working on and how together as a group we um, come together to think more diversely about plant form and function and that by having a bunch of different systems that we're working on, we're learning from each other and in turn our research is benefiting from um, all of the you know, crazy techniques that we're using and the diversity of, of ways that we're viewing um, science and plant diversity and, um, be, and, and adaptation because of the different systems that we're all working in. Um, and so that is one of the reasons why I have a number of co-authors on this talk and I will introduce them as I go through uh, the slides. But I just want to start by saying I, you know, I work in, in phylogenetics as part of what I do. Um, and oftentimes people talk about the tree of life. And I always think of this image because it's like, oh, there's a tree of life and it's out there. And if we just had it, we could hold it in our hands and understand everything that there is to understand. Um, but more and more we're recognizing that it's not so much a tree of life, but it's a, a web of life. And hold on one second, I'm trying to. And, um, and rather than looking at each of the leaves of this tree, one lineage at a time, we're starting to recognize how critical it is to understand the interactions that are happening among species and across lineages and how these influences of temporal and spatial interactions can really alter phenotypes in unpredictive ways. So I always say that your, pheno your favorite phenotype might actually be um, the result, not just of genetics, but of epigenetic interactions and organismal interactions that influence it. Um, and so data about organismal development and the genetic and phenotypic diversity that it influences are enabling us to look down the branches of the tree of life and start to understand the mechanisms by which the leaves or the taxa that we're interested in have evolved. And now it is not letting me go forward. Why is that? All right, let me try it this way. You may have to click the stream. Okay. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I there's like 800 ways to do everything, and we're all learning them as we as we move into being advanced technology experts, each and every one of us. Um, so then, thinking about um, the a, a key goal of my lab is to characterize and understand the realization of phenotypic diversity through developmental processes. So we're concerned with how development patterns and processes mediate evolutionary changes in organismal form and function. And this includes the generation of multiple phenotypes from one genotype or even the convergence on a single phenotype from multiple genotypic inputs. Of course, the environment is in there too, so that um, makes e things even more exciting. So in particular, we're concerned with how developmental patterns can mediate evolutionary changes in organismal form and function. Um, and one more way to represent this, I think about we, we think about going from the genome to the phenome and how have genomic and developmental processes evolved to generate new morphologies? And does the evolutionary history of those organisms actually bias that trajectory as it goes from genome to phenome and bias the evolution of novel morphologies? And so um, in order to do this, we need to understand relationships. We need to resolve phylogenetic relationships um, at both species level as well as at population levels. We can use then estimates of gene flow or as fossil dating within phylogenetic contexts to understand timing of diversification. And then we can characterize the genetic networks that are associated with phenotypic development and investigate the role of those networks, not just in the individual, but also in evolving uh, morphologies across lineages. 
and so my uh, this whatever outline slide is daunting and I promise you it, it will not be as daunting as it sounds but I'm going to go through these various um, uh, organisms and um, ideas to kind of paint that picture of how we can use some of our findings to understand better how plants adapt and then how those genes might be used not to, to well to breed those into crop species, but also to understand how those adaptations might evolve within the population or within the crop in which they're being, um, being introduced. So I'm going to start today um, by talking about organ identity and work that had been started by me actually as a graduate student, thinking about uh, the ABC genes and organ identity. And this was, of course, in the 90s, 1990s, when um, uh, the Madsbox genes were coming to light as uh, really integral in understanding floral development. And we looked to this ABC model for the construction rules for how a flower uh, develops. And just going quickly in Arabidopsis, you've got A, B, and C class genes. E class genes seem to be expressed everywhere. Um, a class genes expressed in sepals and petals, and A expression alone gave you sepals. B and A together gives you petals, B and C stamens, and C carpels. And one thing I want to note here is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between organ identity and organ morphology in Arabidopsis. And we'll see we blow this out of the water in other plants. But that means that a sepal looks like a sepal, and a petal looks like a petal, a stamen looks like a stamen, and carpels look like carpels. Um, if you move into something like a monocot that has two worlds of tepals rather than separate sepals and petals, it had been proposed by a number of researchers in the late 90s and early 2000s that perhaps just the B-class genes have moved over a bit, giving you two worlds of essentially petals, right? And we can call them tepals if you want, um, but these are two identical worlds that have both A and B-class genes. And this was proposed. Um, and so uh, various researchers went out to look to see if this, if this um, modified Mads Fox model for monocots, modified monocot model, would, uh, would hold true. Um, and I want to use this slide to sort of point out um, uh, two issues that are going to take us through the talk. And one is that there are discordant patterns between gene expression and organ morphology across the monocots. Now, in some groups like ZMAs, you still largely had the ABC model functioning, although the C-class genes, there were two of them, and their function was slightly divided between the stamen and carpal well. Um, and in some tulips, you did find this expression of expansion of B-class genes to the outer world. However, in other tulips, it seemed like the B-class genes were missing entirely. And interestingly, they had um, petals that perhaps were actually all sepals instead of two worlds. Their tepals might have been sepal worlds instead of petal worlds. And so that got a little bit interesting. But we started to see across monocots that many um, uh, monoc um, in the B-class genes this is all B-class genes here. Um, Arabidopsis has two, and they interact as obligate heterodimers in order to function. And in some monocots, um, like in this Agapanthus, you also just have one of each gene, one, one DEF and one GLOW, or one Pistolata and one AP3, and they do heterodimerize for function. However, they're, and they're expressed all the way to the outer tepal, so maybe this is a modified monocot model. But in others, you have three genes of one and one of the other, and they can seem to function as heterodimers or maybe function as homodimers as well. So there wasn't really a, um, a, a universal way to be able to understand gene copy number, gene expression, and the function of these in, in, in creating organs. Um, I just want to zoom in quickly on the, um, the uh, one clade to, to make this more clear. This is the asparagales. And um, you can see here again up close that this also didn't correlate with, with the features of the worlds in that the grape hyacinth has all petal-like looking structures. Everything's expressed everywhere. But asparagus also has all petal-like looking structures and the outer tepal whorl has no B function in it at all. So the copy numbers and the expression patterns are gonna really be essential to, to understand what's happening with these organs. And also to think about you know, what makes an organ a sepal or a petal. Is it at position or is it what it looks like? And so that's what, uh, um, I'll introduce the Zingibrales in a second, but that's what I was sort of dealing with and looking at the, some of the flowers that I was looking at in that we had these structures. Can you guys see my pointers? 
pointer if I use it? Is it going around? Okay, great, thank you. Um, and so we had often called these structures here um, petaloid stamens or staminodes, but they were petaloid. And that's because they sort of look like a petal in the classical term of a petal of a lily or of an Arabidopsis. However, the petals of canna um, don't look like petals at all. In fact, they're sort of sepaloid, if you will, and a little bit longer. And so the question of whether or not the petal genes, in quotes, were on in the stamen whorls um, doesn't make sense because you wouldn't expect these petal genes to be on in the stamen whorls. And so which petal genes are you looking for? So it was really important to understand that we call these uh, stamens because of their position. Um, they look like petals because they look like petals of other plants. And so maybe we need to talk about the morphology, about what makes them petals, petal-like looking, um, rather than thinking about identity as a, as a as a construct or as a process that we can unfold. And if we go beyond that, um, you can see that this one-to-one -one correlation between the position and the structure in Arabidopsis gives this false impression that organ identity is a feature, is a static feature of an organ, where in fact it's really an emergent property of the underlying dynamic of interactions between re uh, regulatory networks um, and organ development. So this is a Strelitzia, this is Canna, which I showed before, and this is a Costus. And I just wanna point out the stamens and Strelitzia are long and filamentous. Um, the petals look like nothing that you would call a petal. In fact, what they're trying to do is look like stamens so that it looks like they have more pollen on them and that is attractive to birds to come in. And that's what you're seeing up here. This is not pollen, this is colored petals. And the pollen is actually touched, tucked deep inside. Um, and then, you know, and then the sepals, I don't know what they look like here, but this idea that uh, we need to think about uh, not exactly organ identity, but really what the organs look like, their organ morphology, and what genes might underlie, or genetic networks might underlie those morphological characteristics. So um, I'll now introduce the Zingibrales and talk about them for a little bit. Um, it, this is a, a clade of monocots that are within the comelinid monocots. So that makes them relatively close to things like palms and grasses, which we heard about today um, from Toby. And um, that position early on made them really helpful for doing gen uh, genomic analyses because I had whole genomes from relatively closely related lineages that we could use uh, to make homology assessments. Um, the Zingibrales, uh, without going into too much detail, are loosely divided into two sets, the banana families and the ginger families. And what's important to know that, note here is that in the banana families, you have these stamens like I showed you in Strelitzia, which is here, one of the banana families. And these are long filamentous stamens with the theci located on top. And there's usually five or six of them. Um, they're a monocot, so they're in worlds of three, and they have two worlds of stamens, giving them a potential for six stamens, so an outer and inner world. And oftentimes, one of the members of the, um, of the inner world is aborted, so that there's only five stamens, fertile stamens. In the ginger lineage, um, this, this number of fertile stamens has been significantly reduced to one single fertile stamen or even a half stamen in Canna and, um, and, Mar and then the Marantesi. The remaining stamens are petaloid or laminar with um, conical epidermal cells, they're bright shiny, and they form the majority of the floral display. And so for example, here's a costus, and what you're looking at is all stamen tissue there. There's no petal that you're looking at. The same here with canna, these are all stamen tissue that you're seeing, and also here with the Marantesi. Um, and furthermore, in the Costaceae and Zingibraceae, there's been fusion of these staminodial elements to form a novel structure called the labellum. And this is just some pretty pictures of labellum to show you labella, to show you what, what they look like. They really do dominate the floral display. And if you're a pollinator and you're approaching one of these species, you're looking at the labellum for your clues as far as your landing platforms or the tubular structures that you'll put your bill into uh, to grab the nectar. Um, and that your bill will ultimately co-evolve with to become a perfect form to be able to reach that nectar. Um, and um, speaking, um, anthropogenically of organisms that aren't human. Um, but so what this has um, started to allow us to think about is how there's an evolution of fitness and form because when you have something like Musa, which has many stamen um, and they're covered with pollen, the pollen go everywhere. So there's a lot of pollen production um, when there's more fertile stamen. 
when you have these petaloid stamens, there's a reduction in fertility, for reduction in pollen production. However, there's this greater participation in the floral display, and that has to do with getting the pollinators into the right place. So when you're thinking about fitness of these plants, you can't just think about, oh, how much pollen are they producing? You have to think about where is that pollen going? Is it getting onto a particular organism? And how well is it being delivered to the stigma of the conspecific so that it can affect fertilization? So um, thinking then about um, these processes underlying form and function, I've now taken the zingiberales and cut them out into looking at the sepals, the petals, the stamens, and the carpels. And I just want to bring up three um, trends or processes that are going to be important in this talk. Um, one is this idea that we've got this reduction in fertile stamens, but then it's been replaced by this petaloid structure. So there's this idea that there's this common thing in the petal and the stamen world. And I've already shown you that that's not quite true. The stamens are doing something different than the petals of their own plant. But there was an early question as to whether or not the petals were just been moved over into the stamen well. Um, so you've got this comparison between filamentous stamen and laminar or petaloid stamen. Um, you then also have this uh, perianth dimorphism where in some, in, in Musa, you have two worlds of petal-like structures, whereas in everybody else, you've got different types of sepals and petals. So there's uh, perianth dimorphism or separate sepals and petals. So you've got two different types of developmental possibilities between the sepals of Musa versus the sepals of the remainder of the order. And then finally, there's fusion or and sometimes lack of separation uh, between worlds. And so fusion happens in the labellum, of, in the stamen worlds of, of uh, costas and um, costaceae and zingiberaceae. And it happens between the sepals and the petals of musa, although one petal is left free and, and is, is put off to the side of that. So I initially thought about this from a very much an organ identity perspective and worked with many of graduate students and postdocs um, and undergraduates in my lab, uh, first at Berkeley and then moving to Cornell. Most of this work was done at Berkeley um, and um, when I was at UC Berkeley. And we looked at the Matzbox genes, specifically the B-class genes, also the C and the E, to try to get at, um, and that's because in monocots, the A-class genes are not involved in, in floral development. Um, and largely to get at what, what might be happening. How many copies do we have? Where are they expressed? And so this is just a show. We looked at the copy numbers. For most of them, we had more copies than you would have anticipated from Arabidopsis, but as many as you would have anticipated from all the other monocots that had been looked at. And then we looked at gene expression and specifically using Costas and Musa as our model organisms to say, okay, does gene expression happen as we might have thought? Do we have tepals in Musa with common B-class expression all the way out to the outermost world? And then what's going on with these petaloid stamens? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, when we did this comparative gene expression, what we found was that, um, boy, it's just all over the place. Um, it, it, I always say this is like a bad game of Jenga. You've got a lot of expression um, and no real patterns came through. And without going into, into any details, I'm going to say that just the, out, the wow moment that came out of this is that we realized that so in Costas, these petaloid stamens had a particular gene expression pattern. And we found the same expression pattern in the petaloid stamens of Canna um, and in some of the petals of Marantaceae, which are somewhat more petaloid. Um, Marantaceae and Loeaceae. So we started to think, well, maybe it's not really about um, the organ and where it is or the identity, but maybe it's about this process of what the organ looks like. And that led us into thinking about petaloidy as a process. So there's two things that make something petaloid. One, it's shape. It's laminar rather than being radial. Um, and that's shown over here with Musa being a radial filaments and, and Canna being very laminar. And then there's also visual qualities involved. But today I'm just going to focus on the shape or the laminar. And so research in the uh, early 2010s had um, started to, and, and even uh, prior to that, had started to understand that um, this laminar shape was the result of a pol polarity network. And that when you had a balanced expression of adaxial and abaxial expressed genes, you would get a margin and at that margin, you would have outgrowth of, um, of, of a lamina. Um, 
So this laminar, this primordial, prim, primordial polarity network looks like this. You've got fab, fab, and rev, which are three genes that are on the adaxial side, again, in Arabidopsis. And then you have the Kanadis and the Yabbies, which are on the abaxial side. And balanced expression of those genes will give marginal expansion. So our hypothesis, um, and so this is the way I've sort of uh, cartoonized that network. And then our hypothesis was that um, this polarity network would be um, used in making this morphological differentiation across the Zingiberiales. So perhaps in Musa, the network was broken, the balance was broken, and that led to a radialized filament. Uh, whereas in Costas and Canna, you had balanced expression giving you this laminar structure. Um, also, we could think about whether or not the laminar stamen was uh, that we have in our early diverging lineages of angiosperms was in fact balanced as a, as a laminar structure. And so that's where the musa becoming broken comes from. So in fact, Costas and Canna would be the ancestral form and musa independently broke its, um, its uh, well, Moose, I should say the whole banana group, sorry, broke that um, lineage, um, broke that balance. And, um, and we're still looking at that question as to if this balance is broken in the same in Musa, Loeaceae, and Heliconiaceae, or whether or not it's um, evolved, the ancestral form of the Zingiberiales was to have that balance broken. So what, uh, and this is the work of Ana Almeida, who was a graduate student at the time, and um, I brought up her name before, and is now a, um, assistant professor at Cal State University East Bay. And what she did as part of her PhD work was to take the MUSA, uh, take uh, comparative transcriptomics using organ-specific transcriptomes. And she took the, the um, transcriptome from MUSA, which is radially fil filament, and Costas with its petaloid filament. And she looked at uh, the expression of genes compared across those groups. And most genes were expressed one-to-one -one between the two, um, had a very similar expression um, however, there was one gene that was incredibly highly expressed in Musa, but had a very low, relatively right along the line of expression in Costas. And if you put that into a, a more of a graphic form, you can see that this gene, um, sorry, okay, Musa is up here. So this uh, gene is a Yavi 2.5 gene, is very highly expressed in the Musa filament. It's very not, you know, low expression in Costas filament. It also has a high expression in the Brassica Rapa filament. Um, indicating that maybe this is the idea that this boundary um, has been broken, and it's broken by a Yabby 2.5 gene. Um, in addition, there's a Kanadi gene that also has high expression in the filament, um, and farther studies led us to say that, okay, yeah, this is what seems to be happening. In these filamentous structures, you have an unbalanced polarity network caused by the overexpression of one of these uh, genes. Um, in this case, they were the Kanadi and the Yabby, so they're on what we think is the abaxial side. However, in maize, uh, it looks like these are flipped, and so it's it's not exactly, we're not still sure in the Zingiberiales as whether it's adaxial or adaxial, but we do know that it's it's flipped relative to that expression. Um, so this gets into saying that uh, rather than looking at this organ identity, which required an assumption that identity itself was a process, we need to start thinking about all of the different processes that underlie the morphologies that we're interested in. Um, we then, we move to laminarity, which is a process. It's part of this polarity gene network. And we can see that the process is, is that you get the breaking of the network when you get a dis, an unbalance of expression, either on the abaxial or adaxial side. Um, and so then the other process we wanted to really start looking at was fusion. Uh, because we know we have fusion in the floral tube of um, Musa, and also that's creating this beautiful and charismatic labellum of Costaceae and Zingiberaceae as this fusion is, is part of that. And so this is now the work of Heather Phillips, who's a second year graduate student in the lab, and Heather has really taken on fusion as her, uh, with a tour de force to see if we can start to understand, using Zingiberaceae as a model system to start to understand what's going on in fusion. And so what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is transition into other processes that we've been looking at, first in the Zingiberiales, but also in other systems and students that I have working on different systems um, to get at how these processes are underlying organismal evolution in the lineages for which they're, um, uh, in, the, in the lineages for which they confer some kind of um, adaptive and evolutionary uh, scenario, adaptive advantage or evolutionary scenario. 
So, um, and Heather just gave a departmental seminar today at noon. Um, uh, so during the lunch break, if you made it over to her departmental seminar, not physically, but virtually um, she, here at Cornell. Um, and she talked about this in, in even greater detail than I'm gonna tell you about today. But fusion is a really interesting process in plants because it is not a single thing. Uh, we recognize fusion um, as the result of um, separate organs that come together to form a single unit, often called synorganization. That unit then develops its own develop evolutionary trajectory. It functions as a unit. Um, it, is, it often is a key innovation uh, that allows for diversification and specialization of form. And it can happen through multiple developmental trajectories. Um, so as Heather says, it's not just a lack of separation. Um, and I won't go through those developmental trajectories, but I'm, I'm sure many of you have dealt with them in, in your work. Um, there is a, um, we do know that in, in at least um, a couple of model systems, this trajectory, developmental trajectory, and maybe more than one, is mediated by these boundary genes, or the NAM and CUC genes. And um, these genes are, are critical for keeping primordia separate. If you don't have expression of these genes, then the primordia don't separate. Um, whether or not they actively fuse is what's in question and needs to be studied on an individual. This is going to be like the abscission zone, I feel like, with, um, with Toby's talk, that it's going to be different in every single situation. But um, we're going to try to find that common thread. Um, and I did have to show a picture of uh, Narcissus here of a daffodil because uh, this is one corona that we can all be uh, behind these days. And they're flowering right now here in Ithaca. So, um, but that's an example of fusion and of a novel organ. It is not a petal or a stamen, it's something in between, literally physically in between. Um, so within the Zinger Borrelis, uh, we have a couple types of fusion going on. Within the banana lineage, we have the adnation of sepals and petals. Um, and the stamens are typically unfused. Within the ginger lineages, we have the fusion of these petaloid stamens to form the labellum. Um, there is also a single fertile stamen that does not fuse. So something has to tell that organ um, to not join in with the crowd. Um, and this is the same with banana. Somebody has to tell that single free petal not to join in uh, with, the, with the others. And then in all of them, there's a fused trimeris carpal. So fusion does happen um, in the um, in the carpal structure for, for in the gynecium of, of all of these plants. So knowing what we now know of the um, NAM and Cook 3 lineages, Heather looked into you know, where these genes are produced and what kind of mutants they form. And uh, they've been characterized in Petunia, um, uh, which has a nice fusion phenotype in its flower, as well as in Arabidopsis. Um, and it's been shown that there are um, a, it's a little complicated, but we understand, from what we understand, there's uh, nam cuc genes in gymnosperms, the nam cuc 3 genes are in gymnosperms. However, there's a gene duplication that occurred at the base of the angiosperms, and some other farther duplication that might be specific to the brassicaceae. Um, but the data that Heather has been pulling up um, leads to suspect that it might be a little bit larger than the brassicaceae, or might be a little bit more complicated than, than we once thought. So this is a tree that Heather made along with a postdoc in the lab, Jacob Landis, and a um, rotation student, David Wickle. And they pulled out contigs of the NAM and Q3 genes from the 1KP data set, so a bunch of transcriptomes. Um, and those transcriptomes assembly, as well as contigs taken from MCBI, and they made this large tree. You can't read that, so let me zoom in a little bit closer. And just to say that there is, Heather found again, that there's this nam q 3 lake clade that is, in the, that is in the gymnosperm, so it's sister to the angiosperms, and then there is this duplication that occurred in the angiosperms. Um, that duplication seemed to generate separate q 3 a, a q 3 clade, and then a separate NAM clade. Right? Now this is the top of the tree, and now in the next slide I'm gonna go to the base of that tree. So now looking down, the, the, the q 3 clade was up here, Here's the cuke one and cuke two clades that were defined for Arabidopsis, and Arabidopsis is shown in, in, um, with a star. And you can see that there's many other taxa that are in this cuke one and cuke two clade. Um, they are, some are brassicaceae, but others are not. And many of them only have one copy. So they'll either have a, they'll have a cuke three, 
and then their NAM is either closely related to the Arabidopsis cube through two or closely related to the Arabidopsis cube one, but they won't have that two copy. So it's, it's unclear as to whether or not there have been uh, additional duplications that are and losses. And what we're seeing is the result of that many of them had the Q1, Q2 duplication, but then there's been losses. Or if there's some really interesting selection going on that's causing these two Arabidopsis genes, instead of falling out together, falling out together, to fall out in two separate clades due to some clade-specific selection that's happening, um, potentially due to different function of those clades. So what we need to do is to look at, um, and Heather's on this, any specific motifs which differentiate between the cube one and the cube two. Um, and identifying those motifs, seeing how they link with their function during boundary formation, um, and then looking at site-specific selection, regulatory regions, and any expression patterns that might give some clue as to what the NAM versus the cube three clades are doing, and then within the NAM, what those different clades might be doing when organisms have more than one copy. Um, and she's using transcriptome data from the Zingibrales to identify additional NAM and Cube 3 genes to start with a model clade approach. And what she'll be doing is looking at expression of uh, the NAM Cube genes across the Zingibrales to see if they're involved in the adenation that you see in the Musa, in Musa using Musa Basju as a model organism or in the conation that you see in the stamens using Costa spicatus as a model organism. And also it's important to note that there's these gene regulatory networks associated with QQ2, Q, I'm sorry, with the QQ genes, QQ1, 2, and 3, that involve some microRNAs and also that involve um, PIN um, and auxin accumulation. And how all of these relate to boundary formation is particularly interesting in that there's also genes that are specific to petals and genes that are specific to stamens. So there might be regulation that is specific to where that boundary is informing. It might, fusion might not be the same when it happens but, um, within a, the stem or the shoot of an organism or when it happens within the flowering component of, of, a, of the same organism. So that's gonna be something to look at. So stay tuned for that. And also then still within the Zingibrales um, and thinking about things like fusion, thinking about color, coloration patterns, thinking about pollination. We're looking at the convergent evolution of these different pollination syndromes um, within Costaci. This is work being done in collaboration with Anna as well as uh, two postdocs in the lab, Eugenio Valderrama and uh, Jacob Landis. And in this case, we have these wonderful species pairs of a bee pollinated and a bird pollinated taxon. And we're interested in seeing how these species pair fall out so that we can see if um, there's different gene expression, different selection in genes that have these closely related species. However, they're able to be so different in their pollination syndromes and different in their floral form and in their inflorescence form. Um, and we'll be looking at different SNPs that might occur between bee versus bird pollination, selection differences that might occur on the genes that seem to cluster with the bird or bee pollinated plants, and then also expression differences in those, in those taxa. Um, so I'm going to skip two slides for the interest of time and move to um, some work that we've been doing now with Calicordis. And so this is also in the monocots. You'll notice a trend there to say within the monocots, um, although they'll blow that out of the water too at the end. And um, looking at, again, looking at the flowers, looking at floral syndromes and using this as, an, as a way to get at the genes that are underlying really large phenotypic changes that occur within this group. Now within Calicordis, there's four, di four different floral syndromes, the Mariposa lily, the cat's ear, star tulips, and fairy lanterns. And if you happen to be on the West Coast right now, you're probably seeing some of these, they're flowering. Um, there's people out there collecting them for us, which is fantastic. And Adriana will hopefully get out there later this semester, or uh, later this um, season. And you can see that they have, while the Mariposa lily seems to be the ancestral form, there's multiple evolution of these different forms throughout the phylogeny. So you've got the cat's ear, the star tulip, and the fairy lanterns evolving multiple times. And we've already started to look at some of these traits that are involved in these. So the nodding is something very characteristic of the fairy lantern. And we're wondering, how do you get from something that's nodding to upright? And because again, like in Costas, we have these species pairs of relatively closely related fairy lanterns with a cat's ear, um, in this case, a, a mobilis with monophilus, we can start to tease apart the traits that might allow these things to go from nodding to being erect. And then from being very glabrous 
to having um, huge amounts of trichomes located here on the petals. The sepals don't have trichomes, however, so we can also compare sepals to petals to get at this trichome difference. And that's one of the things we've been using um, uh, differential gene expression to look at using um, organ-specific and taxon-specific transcriptomics. But the story of Calicortis that I want to talk about in more detail today is that of, uh, of graduate student Ariana Hernandez, who is a fourth-year graduate student um, and is funded by an NSF um, um, uh, graduate research fellowship. And um, Ariana is really interested in polymorphism within species. And this is, becomes a really interesting thing for breeding as well, because we often talk about traits as though they, they occur and there might be a little bit of variation. But there are some traits that are just really inherently polymorphic, and Calicortis species seem to really have a lot, have to, to seem to have a lot of these. Um, these are three species, Albus, Weedii, and Plumeri, that are all polymorphic. However, none of them are as polymorphic as the queen of polymorphism, Calicortis venustus. So these are all the same species. Um, in fact, some of them can all occur within the same population, and um, yet, uh, and we know that they're the same species for a variety of reasons, but they've got this diversity of petal color, of petal spot presence, and of anther colors that makes them um, a really interesting uh, characteristic uh, trait to study, polymorphism to study within this lineage. So Adriana is looking at the genes that are involved in color formation, uh, wanting to know, you know what genes are involved using differential expression analyses, is selecting acting on these genes at the population level, and then what other traits are associated with petal color. And this includes epidermal pattern, patterning of the spots to say that you know, a spot is more effective if it has conical epidermal cells or if it has flattened epidermal cells because then it can, it can function more effectively in attracting um, pollinators or other functions that it might have. So looking at these other, um, even cellular traits that are associated with petal color. But in order to do this, she really needs to understand what's going on within the populations of Calicortis. So we have different phenotypes. Are they differently placed um, across the biogeography? So this is the distribution of Calicortis venustus, and these circles show where these different phenotypes occur. And you can see in the southern populations, you have almost the full suite of polymorphism, everything from white to deep red. And in some of the uh, populations along the Sierra, although you'll have more white, you can also see the deep reds, the purples, the violets occurring in these populations. If you go more coastal, you get more white populations, and also as you go north, and along, so this is, I'm sorry, I should say, this is, I'm just assuming everybody knows this is California, um, but this is California, and this is the Central Valley, and it's ringed by the, uh, the coastal range and the Sierra Nevada. Um, down here is where you have LA, down here at the bottom, right, oh, right in here. Um, so uh, Los Angeles is located here and the, the bay is right up here. So here's Berkeley. Um, and so, you know, what is the gene flow among these populations? How can you allow, uh, how can you maintain such um, polymorphism in populations given this gene flow? And are there um, polymorphisms and selection under, in these populations that might underlie the, the different coloration patterns that are occurring? So Adriana used a, um, uh, RNA-seq analysis to obtain her data to, uh, from collections from across that range in California, um, calling, filtering the samples, uh, sequencing getting the libraries, filtering the samples and calling SNPs, and then analyzing those to infer population structures and gene flow across the structures. And um, she had um, just under 200,000 SNPs that she used to, to do these analyses. And so what she found is that the genetic clustering uh, really shows that there's geographic cohesion rather than phenotypic differentiation. So all the red ones aren't the same thing. In fact, you have populations that are very polymorphic and those populations are clustering together. Um, you've got this, uh, the purple population down here in the south surrounding the Los Angeles area and a little bit to the north of that. And then you've got uh, populations that go up the Sierra and a different set of populations going up the coastal range. And those are these here. This group of populations here is shown in this uh, structure analysis uh, here. So this group, there's clearly some sort of hybridization going on um, with the, the, some of the purple populations here. So this is all the gray, I should say, right here, um, moving up the, the coast range. And so you, you can see clear population differential, but you can also see that there is some gene flow and there is some admixture going on in some of these populations. 
Um, this is an interesting group. This is a group that occurs um, only in Kings Canyon um, here in the Sierra Nevada and um, uh, the giant redwoods area. And so that might, you know, might be some sort of um, obliquial population there. It's going to be interesting to get at that more closely. But also Adriana noticed that there is a pattern of isolation by distance, uh, the largest genetic differentiation between be being between these northern populations. And it seems like the populations came from a more southern distribution and then have moved up the coast range and moved up the Sierra and gene flow is maintained along those populations. And so just in summary of that, um, we have variation and there, uh, the next step is to really start to look at the ecological associations and the function of that variation. So are there pollination uh, reasons why you get mostly white flowers in the north and the disparate uh, polymorphic populations in the uh, south? Are they pollinated by different pollinators? Are they different temperatures? Um, you can imagine a red flower being a lot uh, um, Dark, a darker flower having a lot more heat than a lighter flower, and does that influence timing of flowering? Does it influence, influence pollinator preference? Um, and then also, could this be for UV protection? Adriana had noticed that the, um, the darker color flowers tend to be higher up in elevation, and that might be indicating that they're having some anthocyanin production as a response to UV, exposure to UV. So using all of these methods, using the population genetics, using the differential expressions analyses, we can start to get at what are the, um, what are the genes underlying these different traits and how they might be functioning at, at, within these populations to, uh, to generate different adaptive phenotypes. So looking at, um, I know I'm, I'm running on time, but I will go through this. So um, another student in the lab, um, Jesus Martinez Gomez. So actually Adriana is a third year student now and Jesus is a fourth year student. Sorry, I'm losing track. Um, it's hard in isolation. Um, we, uh, Jesus is looking at inflorescences in, um, as, as branches and branching patterns within, um, within monocots and particularly within the asparagales. So those of you who have studied inflorescence development knows, know about words like umbels and thyrses and cymes and bostrices and double racemes and panicles. Um, especially if you work on grasses, you know panicles. And um, there's a, the structure of the, the umbel is characterized in the umbelifery um, or the APAC as, as this umbel structure. But allium in the um, asparagales has also been characterized as having an umbel. And it looks very superficially, at least very similar to that in the umbelifery. Um, however, uh, outside of the amaryllidaceae, you have, uh, outside of the um, allium, you have the amaryllidaceae. And that inflores inflorescence is characterized as a bostrix. Um, a bostrix or a helicoid sign. And in the bottom of the slide, I'm just going to show you how that evolves. Uh, a bostrix is, um, is a sympodial branching or a sign where you get the termination of a, of a branch and then the next branch terminates, the next branch terminates, and so on. Um, it has thought that the allium umbel evolved from that type of sign. Um, and that it did so through different types of branch rearrangements and then differential branch elongation. And so here I show a raceme, which again is a monopodial structure. So you've got a single axis and then all of the flowers are coming off of that axis versus the cyme, which is a sympodial structure, many podia making up that structure. So in a raceme, you could also imagine evolving an umbel from a raceme where you just had a lack of internodal elongation. And developmentally, that actually might be simpler. However, because, it was, um, because the allium is clustered within this larger, um, sorry, the larger amaryllidaceae, it was thought that it was likely evolved from that cyme structure. So Asus has been testing this, um, looking at different continuous time Markov models to see whether or not it is more likely in a phylogenetic context that the umbel of allium is derived from a racine or derived from a cyme. This is the phylogeny that he has of all of the asparagales. You can see it includes the amaryllidaceae here, includes the asparagaceae, and, um, and here is the, um, and the orchidaceae are included as well, and iridaceae. And in the amaryllidaceae, that's where you would be getting the, the umbel of the, of the allium. And you can see all of these are coded as being that umbel structure that you see in the amaryllidaceae. Um, I should say he's been doing this work with two undergraduate assistants, uh, Jason and Aaliyah. 
and they've been coding all of these uh, morphologies from the literature. And he has shown using his models and this phylogeny that in fact the ancestor of the Amaryllidaceae umbel is a raceme. So this umbel did derive from a raceme-like structure rather than being syme derived. So um, Jesus's next steps are to look at this umbel evolution in the context of models um, uh, present I'll say it. I'm not going to say it because I'm going to say it fast. Um, there's some models of different uh, morphological evolution where you can see how branching structures evolve through time. And using leafy as a gene, as a candidate gene, you can evolve all these different structures. However, Przinskowitz's models did not have an, an umbel in them. And so he's just been adding uh, elements using uh, terminal flowering one, TFL1, and leafy to try to get the structures that he needs to, be, to derive an umbel. And then using tissue culture, using transformation to see if he can take the umbel of garlic and either downregulate or upregulate leafy to see if he can re-evolve or you know, redevelop this raceme or this sign that you see in the ancestor condition. Okay, and I'm really running out of time now. And so I'm gonna go through these um, relatively quickly and I know it's gonna cut into my, my my talk time, but it, I have the, the whole slide view, so I can't see Taylor, and so I can't see her yelling at me. And so I'm sorry about that. But um, so uh, Clarice is uh, uh, working in, a, Clarice is a second year student in the lab, and they're working on phyllotaxis, or looking at the arrangement of organs on the plant shoot. And Clarice has come on to a really interesting system where many plants that we talk about are distichus, or alternate in their arrangement, or decussate and opposite in their arrangement. Um, or they're following a Fibonacci spiral, um, which is that spiral phyllotaxy that you see in many of the plant systems that we look at. However, in the genus Costus, or actually in the whole Costaceae, you have a, a phyllotaxic pattern that is spiromonisticus. And it's shown up here. If you know about philotactic uh, ratios, it's a one seven branching pattern with a really interesting philotactic ratio that has only a degree of divergence angle of 47 degrees, uh, which is very different from the 137 that you would expect from a Fibonacci series. And so Clarice is interested in seeing, understanding how this spiromonisticacy is generated. Are there anatomical trends that are associated with this? What happens to the vasculature when you, when you have a uh, primordia being generated so close to one another during the spiraling uh, pattern. And what does natural variation, what can it tell us about the evolution and the ecological associations of these traits? So Clarice has been measuring, even in isolation, changes that occur between the, the vegetative part of, the, of the, um, the plant and the reproductive part of the plant, and how those changes might reflect on the ecological um, nature, uh, this part of the plant doing photosynthesis, the reproductive part of the plant being involved in, in, um, in, in pollination and needing to ac have access to pollinators. And then Clarice has been taking different developmental time points to find that shift between the reproductive, the vegetative and the reproductive um, aspect of Spiromonisticus phyllotaxy. And we'll be looking at oxen, trans oxen transport and gene expression of, for example, in all the pin homologs to see if um, how those are responding to auxin maxima when you have a philotactic pattern that is so close to being, um, where the, the philotactic angle is so close. You don't have that distance that we think about with typical spiral philotaxy that gives us the, the auxin sink and then uh, the next, the next um, organ is produced in that sink. And this can be really important because when you think we are bound in the, the, the crops that we work with, we're really bound by what they do um, for their, um, by their phyllotaxy, their pollination is bound by that, their vegetative growth, whether or not they can put their leaves out and get maximum photosynthesis is bound by phyllotaxy. We kind of think of phyllotaxy as being something inherent and not modifiable. But the research that Clarice is doing might be able to get at how it's possible to modify phyllotaxy to the benefit of a plant um, and, and, uh, and traits that, that the plant might, uh, additional traits that the plant might have that, that changing the phyllotaxy or modifying phyllotaxy might be able to benefit. And so using the natural diversity of phyllotaxy, using that within a phylogenetic context, uh, Clarice has been working to, to get at that. Um, and then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about the work of uh, Carrie Tribble, who's a graduate student who's just finishing up um, and she is at UC Berkeley. 
and she's been looking at underground storage organs and how these underground storage organs have been um, are, are critical in supporting uh, plant growth and development. Now, many uh, many monocot taxa are geophytes, meaning that they do have underground storage organs. And Carrie's work is really focused on characterizing the geophytic structures from a bunch of different plants. But in particular, she's been looking at this lineage Bomaria, which is in the Alstromeriaceae. Um, it's a New World taxon, and you can see here in red where this uh, organism has underground storage structures, so it is a geophyte. It has uh, storage structures that it uses its rhizome in some taxa. In other taxa, it uses these root tubers, and the root tubers are located on the tip of the roots. In some taxa, it uses both a rhizome and a root tuber, so it's, it's really kind of doubling up on the system. And so for many, if you look at herbarium collections, they often don't include this underground morphology. And so Carrie has had to travel throughout South America and dig up a lot of plants and uh, to characterize these root morphologies. So she's looking now at the functional genetics of these morphological innovations, really trying to get at um, the, the transcriptomes of the fibrous root versus the tuberous root to see what genes are involved in making the, the, the tuberous root. And then also comparing that to other organisms that have uh, underground storage organs to see if there is some deep homology um, in, the, in the formation of these underground storage organs. Um, her studies have shown that there is, um, these are PCA analysis, and you can see that they do cluster by tissue types. So these are roots, uh, these are rhizomes, and these are above ground uh, vertical shoots. Um, however, you don't see clustering by the type of fibrous root versus tuberous root in, in this particular analysis. But looking at the functional genetics of morphological innovations across other, um, other starch producing organisms, or, or tu um, tuber, root tuber organisms, she found 271 genes that were overexpressed in the tuberous roots in comparison to the fibrous roots in Bomeria. Many of them were involved in cell wall modification, flowering time, starch biosynthesis, which you would expect. And many of them have also shared with things like potato and onion. Um, even though potato is a different type of tuber, it's a stem tuber, and onion is a different type of thing altogether. It's a, it's a bulb, which is a leaf morphology. So uh, there seems to be something involved in making these underground storage organs. And she's also looking at some of the, taking the next level on some of those genes, such as the PEBP genes, which include terminal flower one, flowering locust T, and mother of flowering locust T. And showing that Bomeria has these genes, they're differentially expressed in tuberous roots versus uh, fibrous roots, and that um, they also are shown here in red. These are also genes that have been shown to be differentially expressed in potato and in allium. And again, that's really interesting given that those are different organs. Um, one is, um, again, one is a bulb and um, one is a, a stem tuber, not a root tuber. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm out of time, and I, and I do have to apologize to Shayla because I'm not going to get to talk about cycads and how cool they are. Um, but I do want to say that we're also looking at really neat things such as uh, thermogenesis in cycads and volatile production in cycads, and how that volat volatile production has co-evolved with the weevils um, that, that um, and with the weevils and looking at the genetics underlying volatile production and how that has evolved across time as well. So I can only, sorry, now I'm, let me see if I can get back to the, I seem to have lost everybody on my, this is not. Uh, that is okay. I can, uh facilitate questions if there's any in the chat. We have time for one question. Can you still, still see my screen? I don't know why I can't. Yes. Okay. And we have a question from Jeff Doyle. Jeff, did you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Hey, Chelsea, nice talk. If we want to understand homologies of current floral structures, should we take as a starting point the most recent common ancestor rather than relying on our preconceived notion of what a petal or a stamen actually is, which at the minimum is implicitly biased by a eudicot-centric view of morphology and development? It seems like anything prior to the common ancestor is in some sense irrelevant. 
have you done any ancestral reconstructions for your Zinja Borelli's flowers? So specifically for the petals and-, and Yeah, that. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, it, you know, it's gonna depend on how far you go out to the outgroups because once you start to move to the outgroups, you start to work, you start to be less able to make homology statements across these different groups. So um, I think that that in, in, in an essence is the entire is the entire problem because you're trying to make homology statements about identity and really organ identity isn't what isn't something that you can make deep homology statements about because it, it's it's an emergent property of that particular organism. So you think about like orchids, there's not a petaled identity of an orchid because there's two different types of petals. And their ancestor, their the ancestrally, we don't know exactly where that evolved. Orchids have it, their outgroup doesn't, their sister lineage doesn't have the two different petal types. But what becomes almost more essential to think about is what is causing that, um, what is causing the difference in, in what you see in that lineage or what's, what's, what's relevant within that lineage. And, and I guess that's the, the point I was trying to make at the beginning is that we really, if we started not thinking about identity, but starting thinking about the process from the beginning, that's, that's where you need to focus. Does that, does that get at that? So thinking about, okay, well, where does, if you think about fusion as the process, what's happening in the ancestor, or you think about petaloidy as the process and laminarity and polarity, then you can say, okay, did the ancestor have this or not? And then how is it involved within this, evolved within this lineage? Um, and I think that even within lineages, we're finding that there's different ways that they can use the same genetic structure, the same genetic pathway to affect um, quite similar phenotypes. I don't know if that got it or not, but it was a, it was a really good question and a very good point. And I hope a point that I kind of made um, throughout the talk. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.